Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. By way of introduction, my name is Ketue Mavundla, and I will be your program director for today's event. It's an absolute pleasure to have the opportunity to welcome you all to the second edition of this year's Monetary Policy Forum. This, of course, being our first in-person event since 2019. Now, as you would know, during this time, we uh, facilitated virtual sessions. Uh, and in keeping with that, please note that today's session is hybrid. And so we are streaming via several online platforms. And so for those of you who are joining us on the online platforms, uh, specifically Zoom, please note that you are welcome to pose your questions in the chat. Uh, and we will read these out to the governor in the Q&A session a little later on today. And for those in the room, uh, for you to note that we have a dedicated team of four who will work the room uh, to offer you guys a mic as you uh, uh, signal that you would like to uh, raise a question. Now let me quickly run through, run through some protocol. Um, your safety matters to, to us. Uh, and so in the unlikely event of an emergency, please note that we do have emergency exits. Uh, right in front of you, there are three uh, emergency exits right behind me. We also have emergency exits just outside of this conference center. You'd find an exit, uh, emergency exit on your left as well as on your right. Now, as we draw closer to what we are all here for today, allow me to welcome the members of the Monetary Policy Committee uh, thank you all for joining us today. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of the former Minister of Finance, Ndlandla Nene, as well as the former Deputy Governor, Daniel Minele. Now, I'm certain that everyone is eagerly awaiting to get a sense of the Saab's view uh, in terms of global and domestic developments and how those inform our economy's trajectory. Without wasting any time, let me welcome the Governor of the South African Reserve Bank and Chair of the Monetary Policy Committee, Lesitja Hanyaho, who will officially open this event. Thank you. Thanks, Katiwe. Uh, uh, good afternoon, um, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, but maybe before I start this, I've got to acknowledge someone. Um, Eric Fesser, um, at the back there, is attending his last monetary policy forum. Uh, he is retiring uh, in, the, in the new year. Um, but age in the Reserve Bank is not measured by how many years you worked in the Reserve Bank, it's measured by how many MPCs uh, you have attended. So he is not a young man. And uh, we would like to uh, thank him for uh, his uh, service to the South African Reserve Bank and to the people of uh, South Africa. I'm sure, Eric, we will still see you uh, around and uh, you know the central bank, when you eventually retire, there will be gallons of liquidity uh, that will uh, grace the equation. But let me also, like Katie, welcome uh, all of you here to this first in-person uh, meeting of the Monetary Policy Forum. Uh, we are all, uh, two to three years older than we were. Uh, it's been a long and trying 36 uh, months since we last convened in person. But as we convene, many economies, both advanced and uh, emerging, have returned to pre-crisis levels of economic output uh, by now. This is true for the domestic economy too. We returned uh, to those pre-2019 levels in the first quarter, we slipped in, uh, back in the second quarter, but we expect that we are now back to uh, those uh, levels uh, again. The attention of global policymakers has now shifted uh, to face the challenges brought about by soaring global inflation. Prices have continued to climb and become more broad-based following the initial shocks of the pandemic, presenting risks to growth now and in the long run. Rising inflation is eroding the incomes of working people. 
And because it is eroding the buying power of their incomes, you see across the world that the public are rising against the, right, the higher cost of living. We are living in an environment where we have got a public that is increasingly intolerant uh, of high inflation. And uh, take note uh, of that. And um, I am sure by now you have uh, realized that the South African Reserve Bank had decided to step in and protect the incomes of South Africans by deploying its tools to deal with rising inflation. Today, we will review where we stand, both globally and domestically. We will take a presentation from uh, Chris Lovald, who is the head of the Economic Research Department and secretary of the uh, MPC. Uh, he will do the slideshow presentation and then uh, normally he passes the difficult questions to the panelists, but uh, uh, Chris, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not pulling a rabbit out of the hat here. Just, uh, before, uh, just in case I, I'd forgotten, uh, Rashad is ever alert. Uh, you will see that there is someone who is not here. He is virtual because he is in Saudi Arabia on bank business, but he is with us virtually. Kuber Naidu. I think they thought I was going to pull Kuben from out from underneath this. But, uh, anyway, nice to see everyone again after a very long period of time. I have to confess that um, <clears throat> when the uh, April 2020 uh, NPR release was cancelled, I was really quite pleased. <laughs> and then <laughs> look what happened so three years later. Um, I've got to figure out how to share my screen. So just give me one moment here. You have succeeded. Okay. Is it all up and running? Good. Uh, finally, let me just thank um, my team for putting together the NPR. Uh, it is an incredible amount of work, uh, and they really do work on it uh, in minute detail up to the last minute. So uh, please do read the document, <laughs> to, because they really do spend a lot of time working on it, and it's very good as a result. So thanks very much. Um, quite a few slides. As usual, I tried to go through them quite quickly, so we have lots of time for uh, questions. Um, these are my bullet points that I always start with. Uh, what do I want to tell you about? Um, certainly, I want to talk a little bit about how stagflation has deepened uh, on a series of reinforcing shocks to the global economy. Uh, some of these are policy-driven, and some of these are event-driven. I won't go into lots of detail on each of them, but I'll give you a kind of overview of what they look like. Um, on balance, the policy uh, response to stagflation has been late. Uh, putting credibility of central banks, in particular monetary policy, at risk. There has been an abrupt tightening. I'll show you what that looks like. And there have been some pretty big impacts on the global economy as a result of these developments. One of those uh, impacts has been one that is important to South Africa, which has to do with the terms of trade being weaker. And it raises the prospect of things like financing constraints for the economy becoming more important, not just for South Africa, for some others as well, and I'll point those out to you as well. South Africa's economic growth um, is reverting to trend after a bit of leveling off, uh, and this is an important thing I think that is uh, easily lost. Uh, as we exited the pandemic conditions, of course, our economies bounced back very aggressively, but the idea that we were going to uh, continuously achieve growth rates of 5 6% uh, was, was uh, uh, certainly uh, an illusion. Uh, and now we're going back to something that looks like a longer term trend. And I'll talk a little bit about what are the factors shaping that. Demand uh, is more buoyant in our economy than a low supply. And I'll tell you what that means for monetary policy. Headline inflation, of course, is sharply higher and it's also broader, and inflation expectations have increased over the period under review. Policy rate has normalized quite a bit and continues to do so, 
the overall repo levels, both in nominal and real terms, are still below where we were pre-pandemic. And then I'm going to finish with a few questions about whether or not we can expect global volatility or perhaps an easing of the rather difficult conditions that we've got at the moment. <clears throat> so this is where I start to speed up. So the global economy is, has slid into, inf into stagflation clearly. Real GDP is the blue line, uh, CPI inflation is the red. These are global estimates uh, for 2022 as a whole. And you can see how those forecasts have changed over time, very systematically going in uh, the wrong kind of directions. We want the reverse. Oops. Inflation has also broadened. So that was the headline I showed you in the previous slide. If we look at uh, core inflation, core inflation is also up across the G3, and which is on the left-hand side. You've got the Euro area, Japan, and the US. And on the right-hand side, we're showing you a selection of emerging market economies, Brazilia, Brazil, China, India, Mexico, and Poland. Uh, and almost all of them have shown, uh, seen very large increases in core inflation. So it's not just headline inflation driven by exogenous shocks. It's now embedding into uh, the price determination structures in domestic economies in ways that are very worrying. Part of the problem of this transition from headline to core is that fiscal and monetary policy has been expanding uh, quite aggressively. And I'm sure all of you have read uh, in detail the back and forth and the very heated debate about this that's been going on for quite a long time uh, in, in the advanced economies in particular. Uh, the fiscal balances is what I'm showing you on the, on the left-hand chart. That's the US and the Eurozone. Uh, and you can see, even as we're exiting the pandemic, uh, these areas are still running very large fiscal deficits. Now, of course, their revenues have bounced back. Uh, so if anything, these are showing you that um, uh, a better picture than is actually happening. They're still spending a lot of money, uh, and that is adding fiscal expansion to the global economy in an environment when it seems quite unwise to do so. I'll come back to that point. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we're showing you real monetary policy rates. So these are the repo rates or policy rates in these areas adjusted for inflation. Uh, and as you can see, through 2021, both those blue and red lines are going further into negative territory. So inflation is going up faster than policy rates are being adjusted, and these economies are moving into more and more expansionary territory. The dotted lines show what the forecasts look like. Uh, and as you can see, those forecasts are really lifting off only from Q2 of this year and into Q3 of this year. So that uh, brings me back to my point about things being left a little bit late. So what's the problem with all that demand? Well, it's intersecting with a series of uh, supply bottlenecks which go back to the pandemic and then have persisted since for a variety of kinds of reasons. Uh, we all know about what is going on in Europe and the war there, and that has exacerbated these supply bottlenecks in a serious way. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the way U.S. demand in particular has been elevated. These are retail sales volumes. So after the pandemic, real retail sales volumes increased quite a lot. In the U.S., they were up to pre-pandemic or above pre-pandemic levels in both the Eurozone and the U.K. as well. So demand is feeding in this very strong uh, uh, consumption of goods in particular around the world, uh, and that has persisted. On the right-hand side, we're showing you the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's Global Supply Chain Pressure Index, uh, and this gives you a sense uh, of the way in which supply pressures uh, have, have, supply chains have put, been put under very intense pressure over time. The far right-hand side of the graph starts with 2020 with that big spike, and then we see it spiking again in 2022. So robust demand is intersecting with these bottlenecks, uh, driven by a variety of different causes, uh, not least the pandemic itself, uh, and generating intense inflationary pressures. At the same time, uh, risk aversion is rising. So everybody is watching what's going on in the global economy and getting ver very worried about it. Um, because the U.S. is move moving a bit quicker than other economies in raising rates, 
they're adding to that risk aversion and interest rate differentials are expanding, so more money is flowing into the US dollar as a safe haven, and that's adding additional inflationary pressures to the rest of the world. On the right-hand side, we're showing you uh, some advanced economy uh, exchange rates to the US dollar as well as the uh, emerging market MSCI index. Uh, and you can see around the world, as the dollar strengthens, these currencies are depreciating at exactly the time when they don't want them to, de to, to depreciate. Um, and, the, and for many of these economies, of course, this will add to further inflationary pressures. All of this is contributing to a risk-off environment, um, which is very dangerous. Uh, I don't mean to beat up on the UK, they just happen to have had this problem in the past week, as you all know, so I thought I'd put in a slide just showing what it looks like. But essentially, this could happen to pretty much any of us. It's the combination of high inflation, late policy, continued fiscal expansion, very high debt levels, uh, and this gives a sense of what those debt levels and current account balances can look like. Uh, it would go so far as to warrant say that in 2020, as we entered the pandemic ourselves, we were very lucky that we didn't have the high inflation problem, uh, but we had some of these other problems uh, as well. And the point I'm trying to make is that going forward, uh, many more economies are likely to be at risk of dealing with markets reacting to the inconsistencies in their economic conditions and the policies that they're trying to achieve. Further policy slips uh, are dangerous uh, for a further reason in the monetary policy environment, not just adding to inflation, but they can also accelerate the de-anchoring of inflation expectations, which I think is the, I suppose all central banks talk about this quite a lot, but it might be the thing that people don't pick up quite as much as they ought to. What one really worries about is what inflation expectations, so households and companies uh, expectations of future inflation, what that's going to look like, and how it relates to inflation today. Uh, and here we're just showing uh, the US headline CPI and the Eurozone headline CPI, which are the, the solid blue and red lines, and then comparing them to uh, five year ahead uh, and 10 year ahead expectations for both the Eurozone uh, and the US. Now, that sort of spaghetti of dotted lines in the bottom right-hand corner might not look terribly threatening, uh, but that is an inflation rate well above the inflation rate that has been for a long time. And of course, the concern for central bankers will be, well, will those dotted lines continue to tick up in reaction to headline numbers rising? So those are the global conditions that we're facing. How are central banks responding to all of this? Uh, well, policy rates have increased uh, around the world. The, on the left-hand graph, I'm showing you policy rates in major advanced economies. The, uh, the, the sort of uh, royal blue is the US, green is the UK, Japan is red at the bottom, uh, and the Eurozone is gray. Uh, and what you can see is that, of course, central banks have now really started to react uh, quite aggressively to the inflation problem and the inflation expectations problem that they see right in front of them. Emerging markets policy rates on the right-hand side have also increased uh, quite a lot. Uh, the blue line is a weighted average of emerging markets, and the red is the, the median policy rate adjustment that we've, that we've seen so far. So let me turn now uh, to South Africa. Um, a point I made right in the beginning is that growth is reverting to a trend I wanted to show you a little bit about what that kind of looks like. Um, essentially, the left-hand graph shows you potential growth, which is in blue, and actual growth is in red. Uh, and these, things, these two lines are starting to come together. You see that very large spike up in the actual GDP growth rate, uh, and that is going to come back down to that blue line, which is the longer run potential estimate that we have. On the right-hand side, um, we're decomposing the uh, growth rate into expenditure and production. Uh, and again, what's interesting about this is just the gaps. So the gap between the red and the blue line in 2020 and 2021 uh, is interesting because what it shows you is that production actually bounced back quite quickly 
and above expenditure, which is the blue line. So it shows you that the pandemic was in many ways really a supply, uh, a supply driven uh, contraction in the economy. And then in the most recent period on the far right hand side of the graph, you start to see expenditure rising above production. Uh, and so demand supply imbalance uh, is coming back to a more normal kind of uh, condition. So what is in that demand component? Uh, certainly economic activity is underpinned by household spending. That's what I'm showing you on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we've been surprised again and again by the strength of real gross fixed capital formation. Uh, we still don't have really good explanations for it, but certainly there seems to be uh, some kind of catch-up happening on the investment side, particularly coming from the private sector. Public sector investment uh, remains extremely weak. Uh, and for state and enterprises is in fact uh, been negative. Um, so these are the two big components alongside net exports. So the other feature of the, um, of the pandemic period, uh, which you will remember was a very strong growth in the terms of trade on the back of commodity export prices rising, and what that represented was a very strong positive demand shock coming from abroad for the South African economy. And that's persisted through this year. Now that growth in demand uh, has not carried through very strongly into credit demand. What I'm showing you on this graph is just the real, the real level in billions of rands of households and corporates credit demand. You can see that over the 2020 to 2021 and 2022 period, demand for credit has improved over what it was in 2018, 2019. You can't see 2018, but you can see 2019. So it's picked up a little bit. Um, conversely, the corporations have, have declined their investment very strongly into the pandemic. So that's that blue line really fell away very sharply and then started to turn the corner sometime in the middle of 2021. Uh, you can see that, uh, here's my cursor, maybe you can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where it started to actually pick up again uh, and has strengthened through the course of this year. So while demand has, has strengthened, uh, it hasn't been driven uh, very, very strongly by, by credit. It's there, uh, but it's not shooting the lights out. Part of the problem we've got is that uh, inadequate electricity supply continues to tighten its grip on potential growth. Uh, we needed to throw this, this one in here, this slide in here, because it really is quite uh, dramatic. You can see how in 2022, that's the red line, the cumulative uh, gigawatts per hour of shedding, of load shedding that we've seen, that the economy has experienced, uh, has been very uh, strong indeed. Now, what do these things add up to? With positive demand, that low potential growth contributes to a steady closure of the output gap that was really created primarily during the pandemic. This graph shows you by the date of the MPC meetings, for, so the MPC meetings for 2020, 2021, and 2022, how our output gap estimates have changed over time. Uh, and what you need to take away from this, I mean, this is a little bit confusing, but what you need to take away from this is basically how in 2020, those red and blue lines, those output gap estimates were falling, they were decreasing, they were becoming more negative. And then very steadily from kind of April, May 2020 already, those output gap estimates started to go up. So in other words, our output gap started to close quite early on in the pandemic, and it's been one-way traffic going up uh, ever since. With that low potential, uh, and here's where I kind of mirror South Africa to the UK again. Things like financing of demand comes into sharper focus. So again, if demand is oversupply, you've got high inflation, uh, policy is trying to stimulate the economy quite a lot, but you've got a very low and weak potential growth rate, uh, then you, it's very easily just easy to slip into a position where you're adding to inflationary pressures, your current account starts to slip into something that looks more like a deficit than a surplus, uh, and p the markets start to question your ability to finance yourself going forward. On the left-hand side, I'm showing you these, again, level terms, RAND billions of investment and in savings. So this is, this is be, uh, the net saving of general government is red, 
You can see they've been consistently net dissavers, running fiscal deficits. You can see the corporates, particularly during the pandemic period, were net, borrow net savers, sorry, not net borrowers, uh, and were, were financing much of those deficits. Uh, but that's starting to change, and that green column is starting to contract as corporates start to invest a little bit more. So as the economy starts to pick up, that financing constraint is going to emerge more and more. On the right-hand side, we're showing you estimates of the current account balance uh, over time. If you start with the blue dotted line, that's the March MPC meeting, we thought we would still have quite a large uh, current account surplus, so net exports were doing their job, uh, but that starts to fall away quite quickly as we get through to May, July, and finally the September meetings, which is the red. So what's happened to inflation? Well, certainly it has consistently surprised us higher relative to the forecasts that we were putting in place. If we look at core inflation on the left uh, and you move to non-core inflation in the middle and then headline inflation, I'm sorry, the September number I think has dropped off, but September would be the blue dotted line. Uh, you can see how in each of those uh, MPC meetings we were, we were, uh, we were shifting uh, up. The one exception is that from the July to the September meeting, if you look on the core inflation on the left-hand side, right here where my cursor is, that green, the July number for core inflation was a bit higher than what ended up happening for September, which is the blue. So there's, something's changed a little bit, and I'll come back to that point uh, in, a few, in a few slides. If we look at non-core inflation, you can see the same kind of dynamic in the middle. From March to July to September, those forecasts kept rising. Uh, and the same is true for headline inflation on the right. Uh, as you know, inflation peaked or has reached a new high at 7.8% uh, in, uh, in, in July. Uh, the drivers of this were quite broad braced. There was a bit of a moderation in August, which is why on the previous slide you had a little bit of a tick down in some of those forecasts. This graph shows you the decomposition of the headline inflation number. Uh, and you can see the, the bottom part is red. The greenish or teal sort of color, I guess, is food and non-alcoholic beverages. Fuel is in the yellow or gold. Uh, electricity is in blue. Uh, and you can see how fuel, food, non-alcoholic non beverages, and core inflation, quite importantly, are now contributing more strongly to this push upward in headline inflation. It's worth noting that roughly from 2019 onwards, so from here to about first quarter of 2021, core inflation was actually pulling down headline inflation. So if you think back to the, one of my previous slides, right in the beginning on the global economy, that link between headline and core is starting to emerge. For food price inflation, uh, which is one of those drivers of headline, uh, is one of those things that we've consistently got quite badly wrong. Uh, this graph again shows you how that uh, food price inflation forecast continued to change over various MPC meetings and, and over the years. Um, we're not sure that it's quite peaked yet and in part, of, part of the problem of course is that domestic food price inflation lags its global counterpart by a significant amount of time. Now, this graph tries to show you what that time period looks like. So we've plotted here the global food price uh, in RAND uh, versus the CPI itself of food. Uh, and you can see all these little dates we'll try to pinpoint to you that those peaks in the red, which is the global food price inflation, are followed by about two quarters with a peak in the blue, which is the CPI for food domestically. So if we look on the right-hand side of that graph, what we can still see is that global food price inflation has systematically been above domestic food price inflation. There are various kinds of reasons for that. Some have to do with, uh, lo most have to do with local conditions, pretty good agricultural outcomes in the economy as a whole. It's one of the sectors that, as you know, has, been done, has done very well. And that's helped to keep a lid on food price inflation or the pass through of global food prices into domestic food prices. But it's starting to, to waver a bit. And you can see that here with this jump up 
in domestic food price inflation. So this is one of the things that we're watching very carefully. The weaker rand has also played a bit of a role for the last couple of years, the high uh, terms of trade, commodity export prices has basically kept the RAND relatively strong compared to what we thought it might do. It's weakened in more recent times and unfortunately that weakening, ha weakening has coincided with uh, fuel prices going up quite a lot and so our fuel, price, uh, fuel inflation forecasts have also shifted up higher. Same sort of story when we look at core goods inflation. If you take out, uh, if, or if, you, if you take core goods and, and highlight things that are more exchange rate sensitive, on the left hand side you can see that those uh, core inflation measures are, are, have gone up quite a lot. Uh, and if you look at the graph on the right hand side, you can see that this is coming through on things like vehicles, which is the green column. Those prices have gone up quite a lot. Household contents have gone up quite a lot. Clothing and footwear has gone up quite a bit. So things that are a bit more exchange rate sensitive uh, have started to creep into core goods inflation uh, and uh, creating risks for the overall headline inflation rate. Similar dynamics are occurring in services. Uh, on the left-hand graph, we're showing you a couple of items uh, like public transport and petrol that are, of course, a, a function of fuel spilling over, or I uh, should say, uh, oil prices rising and then spilling over into domestic inflation rates. And on the right-hand side, one of the saviors of recent years has been very low services uh, price inflation, uh, coming in various forms, in particular housing, which is the blue, uh, but also uh, things like medical insurance. Uh, and you can see that those uh, are now turning around. They've actually increased quite a lot from a very low base, but they are adding upward pressure on core inflation as well. Now, just to uh, repeat myself a little bit, I said we were, uh, central banks globally were worried about inflation expectations. Well, we are too. Uh, this is what ours look like. Uh, and what's quite, what's, what uh, the MPC is focused quite a lot on is the way in which inflation expectations have risen uh, quite contemporaneously with the rise in actual monthly inflation surprises. So as headline inflation outcomes have gone up, so too have inflation expectations, which suggests that inflation expectations could be better anchored, uh, and we clearly don't want to see this sort of thing get out of hand. That red line is the current year, so not surprisingly with inflation uh, well above 6%, Inflation expectations have gone up along that uh, by the same kind of measure. If we look at the one year head, that's the blue, that's also up uh, a little bit here. And then we've seen a little bit of a stabilization in the two year ahead and the five year ahead inflation expectations. And that's clearly a very good sign, uh, but it's marginal and we'll have to watch it, of course, very carefully going forward. So what's the policy response been? Um, here I'm showing you just what the headline inflation rate has done, that's the blue, compared to the actual repo rate. So the repo, while inflation was rising, uh, the repo rate uh, was stable for a very long period of time, uh, just over 3%, and then started to rise in uh, the first meeting that we raised rates was November of 2021, and you can see those step increases over time trying to catch up with that rising inflation rate. Not too many slides left. Um, so what does our normalization path look like? Well, it's been pretty shallow uh, if we compare ourselves to other peer countries. Uh, this is just measuring the changes in policy rates since October 2021 uh, across a range of economies that we might consider our peers. Uh, Hungary and Chile and Brazil and Colombia and Poland are on the far left. And then there's a few countries like Mexico, South Africa, and India right in the middle. Uh, and then some on the right-hand side that have, uh, for various kinds of reasons, uh, not adjusted their policy rates much at all. Uh, some of them have to do with uh, interesting ways of approaching policy, like the far right on Turkey. Uh, others have to do with uh, not very strong pass-through of inflation into their economies and I would put Indonesia, and Malaysia, Thailand, and China into, into that group. The open question, of course, is all, the, is all this enough? 
So have advanced economies move rates far enough to deal with the problems that they face? Uh, this graph shows you uh, the, the existing policy rates of the US, UK, and the Eurozone at the time of the July meeting, that's the blue. The green shows you what's changed since the July meeting. So you can see very large, almost doubling of interest rate levels since the July meeting alone. And then the yellow or orange component of these bars shows you uh, what the expected change in interest rates might look like by the fourth quarter of this year. And then the red shows you the expected change by the first quarter of 2023. The various things to take away from this, one is that, um, of course, there's still some distance to go in the judgment of, uh, of the markets. Uh, it also suggests that um, central banks have moving, been moving very aggressively in recent months. Uh, it also, I think, suggests quite strongly that much of this interest rate adjustment looks to be finished by sometime early next year. Now, that is possible. Uh, as I flagged earlier, the inflation expectations that we see in our own economy have, have kind of on one or two durations have actually stabilized. Uh, it is clear that demand rotation continues away from goods and towards services. Uh, there has been some deflation in food and oil prices or disinflation in food and oil prices, which is what I'm showing you on the left-hand graph. Uh, corn, which is the green line on the bottom left hand graph on the bottom of that left hand graph, all that has also turned the corner a little bit. And on the right hand side, I'm showing you uh, the dollar prices for uh, containers for ocean container freight costs, and these things have come down very sharply indeed. Uh, they've fallen by uh, several hundred percent actually. So these things have, have dropped quite a lot, uh, and those are obviously good indications. It's also true that high inflation uh, tends to be very costly to economies, particularly in the short run. And so as inflation has increased, we all run uh, what's called the New Keynesian model, and that model will tell you that as inflation rises in the short run, it takes away from demand as well. Uh, and so some element of this high inflation that we're seeing is meant to kind of resolve itself, at least in, in the model's heads. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is 2022 and 2023, what uh, the markets think is going to happen to Eurozone and US inflation uh, and relative to GDP growth uh, over these sorts of periods. So inflation is up and GDP is down. So why is there a big problem? I mean, why, why worry about any of this? Uh, well, part of it is that on the short run, uh, while it may pull down GDP, it may not necessarily pull down inflation. And what we know is, over the, is that over the very long run, um, it is very unlikely to reverse inflation on its own. So we all worry about what central banks get up to, and we all worry that they uh, might tighten too much. Uh, but in a sort of sense, they actually have to, and there's a very good reason for doing it. They really don't want inflation to persist. They don't want it to sustain itself. They don't want it to embed in the price determination structure of their economies uh, because what happens is in the long run, they get to very bad growth rates. This graph is just showing you, uh, as best we could cobble together yesterday, a very long-term view going back to 1980 through to 2022, 2023, of the relationship, very rough, between CPI, global CPI, that's the red, against global investment and gross national savings. Uh, and what this, what this is meant to demonstrate to you, maybe not as well as it might, but it's suggestive certainly that over the long run, what central banks are really worried about is how uh, high inflation will end up uh, pulling down investment savings and GDP growth rates in a much more sustained way if it's not dealt with in the near term. So what, do we, what do the uh, uh, scenarios for emerging markets look like? Um, well, I think it's pretty benign. So if we're wor really worried about inflation uh, uh, having legs and persisting for some time, it's not entirely clear that that's priced into what the market thinks is happening in emerging markets. This graph just shows you that, I think, quite nicely. The policy rate at July of the SARB July meeting, again, is that blue rate. 
Uh, but if you add in the green, yellow, and reds, you don't get very much more action on any of these emerging markets. So someone out there believes or is starting to think that emerging markets uh, have gotten past where they need to go. So let me conclude with a few last uh, repetitive bullet points. So policy rates um, are clearly up to prevent de-anchoring. Big question about whether it's enough. Global growth is slowing, supply is easing, and some of those upstream prices, oil, food, are certainly lower. But it's an open question of whether or not we've turned a corner globally or whether more volatility is coming and will those market expectations of what central banks have to do change? Domestically, infl inflation is, and expectations are sharply higher over the period under review. There's a pretty fine balance between aggregate demand and aggregate supply. For those of you who have read our MPC statements very carefully, you will note that some time ago we moved away from saying that, that aggregate demand was very weak and pulling down inflation. That's because we no longer saw it in the numbers. Our hiking cycle has remained relatively shallow. We are catching up on normalization. I think that's the best way to describe what we've been doing. And finally, while hybrid working has become a way of life, so too has data dependence for all of us and our colleagues and other central banks. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Chris, now for the examination. Um, we have a uh, name plate here, so you could tell who we are. Uh, we couldn't organize your name plates. So you can raise your hand uh, and then um, uh, identify yourself, and then uh, we will then uh, take your questions from uh, here, right? At the back, I thought you are part of the organizing team. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, sorry, Ed Stoddard with uh, Daily Maverick, Business Maverick. Um, I, I was just wondering, looking at the graph on, I think it was page 25 of the presentation, of the repo rate and the inflation rate, I was just wondering when you think those two graphs are going to intersect, maybe November or January. Thanks. Any others? Uh, are there any Zoomers? Okay, uh, one, two. Mike Brown, Governor yes. First, um, thanks, Governor. I'm um, just on the, uh, you didn't really talk about interest rates to a great extent other than the repo rate, but we have this very steep yield curve in South Africa, um, which to some extent, I suppose, the long bonds are reflecting inflation expectations. But when you look at policy, do you, and you talk about normalization, do you look at strategies which would bring a, a flatter yield curve? Because would, would that, that obviously would encourage investment. Do you, is there something you could say perhaps about uh, how you view this current steep yield curve and where you think it might be going? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Oh, it's on. Sorry about that. Uh, Governor, it's Pranesha from Bloomberg. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit about the current global inflation shock because it's raised some questions about global central bank operations and credibility. And I wanted to get your take on how you judge the level of trust between investors and central bankers worldwide right now compared to previous crises. Um, and what about the level of trust between the Saab and markets? Do you think there's any need for the Saab to adjust any um, communications or operations in any way ahead of the next crisis? Thank you. Okay, uh, let's take one last one. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Devin. Scoot into the mic. <clears throat> okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Daphne Mukoka. 
Uh, my question is a bit general. Uh, I just wanted to find out about the repo rates. Are we expecting them to go a bit higher than they are right now? Or are they going, uh, are they, are they going to, is there a possibility that they go lower? And uh, if they do go lower, does that mean that uh, in terms of, you, you know what happens once there's repo, the repo rates goes high, uh, we get um, the, 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 all the, the cost that is your, your vehicle, your, 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 bond, your bond houses and et cetera going higher. So if there's a possibility for it to go lower, does that mean that there will be a, a switch to, to, to all the, the, the expenditures that, are, uh, people, that people are carrying right now? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, I will take the first question and um, uh, the last question together. Because the first question asks, uh, when will the repo rate catch up with inflation? And you are asking what are our expectations of uh, the repo rate. The answer to the first one as to when will the repo rate catch up with inflation. You've got to wait for the next MPC and the one that follows. <laughs> But there is a different way of uh, seeing it. Because at the moment you see the repo rate chasing inflation. But maybe we might just catch it. And it might just be that inflation decides that it is trying to go and catch up with the repo rate. Meaning, the adjustments of the policy rate that has taken place could be starting to have an impact on the inflation outcomes and thus inflation starts to come down. And so that then brings me to the next question about the expectations of the repo rates. If inflation continues to climb, the repo rate can only go up. For the repo rate to come down, inflation must come down. And what our forecast was showing you from meeting to meeting starting in 2020, what we were expecting inflation outcomes to be and how inflation ended up starting to rise through 2021 meant that policy had to adjust. Now sometimes when I hear the narrative in South Africa saying the SAP is ahead of the curve. Well, what that graph is showing us is that we're not quite ahead of the, uh, of the curve. We might have started adjusting policy earlier than other central banks did, but we are in no way ahead uh, of the curve. We might be on the curve, but we are in no way uh, ahead uh, of the curve. Expectations of what will happen to the repo rate uh, going forward, we take it meeting to meeting, depending on data and the balance of risks and uh, we are recalibrate policy uh, uh, accordingly. Sometimes you know that economics is in trouble when ancestors come back like Mike Brown. <laughs> um, Mike uh, asks the question about the steep yield curve. And as a young debt manager in the 90s, one of the things we used to look in South Africa is, why is the South African yield curve inverted? And um, um, there were so many interpretations that an inverted yield curve means that there is an expectation that there is going to be a recession and so forth and so forth. It could also reflect that um, the market participants in the bond market um, are concerned about inflation in the near term, but they think that long term you would be able to control inflation. If that was the logic then, that means that a steep yield curve must be uh, reflecting the opposite. But these things do not work symmetrically. 
my take is that the South African yield curve then, which was inverted, reflected the credibility of fiscal policy at the time. That at that time, the fiscal outcomes were always better than what the Treasury was forecast, forecasting. And thus it got embedded in the market that this Treasury always comes with positive surprises. That picture changed post the global financial crisis. The surprises started to be that the fiscal outcomes were worse than what the Treasury had expected. Bar for one year, which is 2017, where you had fiscal outcomes being better than what the Treasury had expected. That meant that there were question marks about fiscal credibility. And the good men and women at the Treasury seemed to have worked very hard to restore fiscal credibility. And like Gary Player said, the harder you practice, the luckier you become. It looks like it had also played itself in that manner at this time round. And such the fiscal outcomes for 2021 and 2022 had positively surprised us. And uh, the Minister of Finance is tabling the budget policy statement. And at the moment, the figures that have come out so far shows that revenue has been uh, outperforming, which could mean then that the Treasury might be in for another positive surprise. And the more fiscal credibility is restored, the more we should see a reaction that takes place through the yield curve. As an issuer, as a borrower, you don't control price. You only control the quantum that you borrow. If the prices that you see with the yield curve steepening and you do not like those, those prices, the thing to do is to cut the amount borrowed and the yield curve will thus adjust. And so that is what uh, our take would be about the yield curve. We are not into yield curve management as the central bank, and we do not think that uh, it, it, we, are, we have got the tools or the power to try and manage the steepness uh, of the yield curve. We can contribute to flatten the yield curve, and the contribution that we bring is to reduce the inflation premium. And that means we have got to consistently hit our target so that we get the inflation expectations anchored within our target, preferably at the midpoint of our target. And by so doing, we would be contributing to bringing down the yield curve. But that is just but one component, the key driver of the yield curve is actually the fiscal, the fiscal stance. Prinesha, trust is not demanded, trust is end. Central banks are facing a very challenging period. In 2020 and 2021, we were all heroes. We provided the stimulus that the economies needed, cushioned them against the shocks, and um, in the process, treasuries across the world got addicted to very cheap money. It doesn't matter which country you are looking at. Treasuries got addicted to very cheap money. In the period leading to the global financial 
crisis. Inflation was contained, and in a way, the period was even characterized by one central banker as boring. And so, an acronym was coined called NICE. Non-inflationary um, economy that is expanding. The global financial crisis set in, and central banks realized that there was one thing they were not paying attention to. Risks that were building up within the financial system. And post-2008, many central banks, including our own, started to have an explicit financial stability mandate. Interestingly, the South African Reserve Bank started to worry about financial stability as early as 2001. We were amongst the early uh, movers. Uh, and so the era of inflation targeting in South Africa that started in 2000 gave the South African Reserve Bank a policy anchor that we didn't have before. Our performance during that era speaks for itself. Less volatile interest rates, less volatile inflation, less volatile GDP growth. And so we can look back and say the introduction of inflation targeting basically took inflation out of the decision-making process of the decision makers because there was an institution focused on maintaining low inflation. Understandably, our conduct through the period gave an impression to the price setters that we are actually targeting 599 and so every time inflation dropped below 6%, there would be a chorus within this square mile that would say that uh, the central bank should now and will actually reduce uh, interest rates. And the central bank used to oblige until the narrative changed. And thus, in 2017, we started to communicate and say that we are going to focus on the midpoint of the inflation targeting range. And we saw the wheel turn around. This is a long way of telling you that the South African Reserve Bank credibility is intact. Our inflation fighting credentials are there to speak for themselves. And if you want to test us, you just have to look at the stance that we take as inflation, uh, as inflation goes up. Is there trust between us and the uh, financial markets? I would like to believe so. But the most important thing is that there is trust between the South African public and the South African Reserve Bank. And that, for me, is what uh, matters. As for the other central banks, um, the speed at with which they are now moving, I can see that they are worried about their own credibility and they would like to maintain it and they do not want to lose that credibility. It takes a long time to build credibility, but you could actually lose it in a fickle. That deals with uh, this round of questions, which were easier. And now you can bring the difficult questions that I can distribute to uh, the members of the panel. Uh, Zianda, do we have uh, Zoomers? Yes, we do, Governor. We have a question online from Danda Zombenya. He says, it's, it's a question in a couple of scenarios. Why is the sub so aggressive in raising rep the rep rate? 
um, when the CPI is driven by cost push inflation, oil, food, imports, and uh, continuous conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Secondly, the CPI is in reacting to the rise in repo rate ever since the November 2021 increases because it's not demand driven and this aggression in repo rate hike is killing the economic growth, people investment and employment. The number of consumers who can't pay their debt has increased. For instance, from November 21, um, her, his or her installments have, uh, for the bond and the car have increased by um, 3,800. What is the question? Uh... <laughs> it's scenario. Okay. Um, okay, we'll take the questions that have been uh, posed. Thank you. Um, the hands in the room. Uh, you can look for another question on the Zoomers. Right here. You, you have got a microphone. There is a hand right in front of you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, Tafadzo Chibanguza from the Steel and Engineering Federation of Southern Africa. My question is specific, and uh, perhaps if I can direct it to the presentation that was made um, earlier and it's really around the electricity tariffs and the um, and the assumptions there that you're looking at for 2023 um, being an energy intensive uh, real sector that's an important area for us and really the question is around if one looks at the application by ESCOM at 32 percent and how NERSA has also got it wrong through the court decisions um, I'm just interested in what you what you are pricing in as a uh, as an electricity tariff for 2023. I guess more importantly, and the outlook and what informs that. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my question is very short. Uh, with the finance minister presenting the MTPPS uh, later in uh, October. Uh, what can South Africa learn from the UK situation? Uh, with what has happened there recently. Okay, uh, thank you very much. It looks like the question is for the other gentleman in uh, 240 Madiba Street. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, speak... Uh, Gov I can Governor? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Andrew Hodson, uh, GCM Financial Services, uh, and wealth management. Um, yeah, maybe I could answer your previous question. Uh, maybe, maybe they should be learning from us, not us from them. But, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, my question, which, which you spoke about just now, is uh, the South African Reserve, Bank's, it, Reserve Bank is very credible and has shown us that over the years. Why? is it that some of the political parties are still talking about nationalization? I know you've shot them down a few times. Why are they still talking about it? Look what's happened to Turkey. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, can we take the last one uh, in this round? So don't panic and think that we will not take your questions. Uh, thanks, Governor. Um, Jeff Schultz from BNP Paribas. Uh, my question relates to, well, builds on a little bit of a question that was asked earlier around um, whether or not the repo rate should catch up with inflation. My question really takes it one step further to say, does the committee believe that it needs to take it beyond inflation uh, to, get it, to get inflation under control? And really, my question stems from a Bank for, um, Bank for International Settlements paper that was released this week, in fact which suggests that the scarring done by the COVID pandemic and any deep recession, in fact, uh, in, um, historically, in the short term, uh, can actually lower potential growth and i.e. output gaps can actually close faster. So in essence, does that mean that a lot of the upside inflation pressures that we're seeing globally, particularly out of the Fed uh, or in, in, the, in the US economy, does that suggest that potentially our economy is running a bit hotter than what is commonly thought in the media. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris, you, you, you deal with the electricity uh, uh, assumptions. Let me take a bite or a few uh, uh, things. Let's start with the Zuma. Why is the sub so aggressive 
But the evidence that we have presented shows that actually we have been quite shallow. We should have been more aggressive than what is being shown here. The other central banks are far more aggressive than, uh, than we are. We took the posture based on our assessment of the South African economy. We do not believe we are aggressive. Well, you say that inflation is from the supply side and you have increased rates and it has not reduced CPI. If you are in the African bush hiking and you set up tent and some cripply crawly gets into your tent, you don't ask it, snake, are you from the supply side of the bush or are you from the demand side of the bush? You manage it. So what we are having here is that when you have got a supply shock, as central bankers we would say, is this shock permanent or is it temporary? And if we believe it's temporary, we see through the shock and we respond to what it has cost uh, uh, after that. Problem here is that you have had a multiplicity of shocks. And the evidence now is showing that the pricing is feeding into the other prices that have got nothing to do with energy and food. And as such, a central bank have got to respond or else inflation is going to de-anchor. You also see it that the price setters, I mean, I get a shock, some of the retailers, they proudly announce that they have been able to increase their prices without the, and I said that, oh, so that tells me that they are now capable of passing the prices to the other parts of the economy. That for me is a sign that second round effects are actually beginning to kick in. But we are also seeing it that um, wage settlements and wage demands are starting to say, but if inflation is expected to be uh, 6.5 and we would like to be compensated, we are not sure that it will end up at 6.5 and so we want plus to that thing. That for me says that the price setters are starting to say that do something and you can rest assured we continue to do something. And we will continue to assess the data, and if the data suggests that we must do something, we will do something. Um, learning from the UK, um, what are the lessons from the UK? I, I think that um, a it's a question if it has to do with MTBPS. If you wait for the other gentlemen to sing uh, later uh, this month, uh, it, would be, uh, uh, it would be useful. Uh, all that I can tell you is that um, whilst the uh, Prime Minister in the UK had said unpleasant things about the Bank of England there, I can tell you without any fear of contradiction that my president had not said unpleasant things to me or to the central bank. And that for us as South Africans, we must actually be proud that much as the political class to scream and they are unhappy, they have not tried to say to us, thou shall or thou shall not we have been given that space. And I think that it is important that uh, we uh, give credit where credit is, uh, uh, is, uh, is due. And um, yeah, but that gentleman is going to say uh, things. Hopefully he will say nice, nice things and maybe he might teach the UK uh, a thing or two. And Watson, this... Uh, nationalization red hearing. We have said everything that we ought to say about it. And we do not think that we will add anything uh, in the value. You had said that the political parties, we have learned over the years not to respond to political parties uh, and we stick in our lane. 
Because you see, if you respond to political parties, that means you are responding, you have to respond to them politically. Now, trying to uh, respond politically to the political parties is like fighting crocodiles in the river. That is where they play, and we, uh, are, we cannot be in the river with the crocodiles. We, we know that we would lose if we were to do that. So we will stay away from, uh, from that. Jeff, um, the, you asked whether we would raise the repo rate beyond uh, inflation. And I guess that is a polite way of saying monetary policy is still accommodative because the repo rate is negative in real terms on a contemporaneous basis, on an, on a forward-looking basis, it is negative in real terms. And you should be considering making it positive. That's what you are essentially uh, uh, saying. Uh, we would like to believe, if you were to use the analogy of a car, we are not slamming the brakes on the car. We are just taking the foot off the accelerator. And uh, I guess you are asking us, shouldn't you take the foot a little bit faster? And that depends on uh, the data. The environment is uncertain. And we will take that posture looking forward. And uh, Chris called it that it is time we return to normalization, he said it. Almost saying what you are saying, but he's a central banker, is more diplomatic than you, uh, and so he says it in nicer ways. I haven't seen the BIS uh, report, but what I can tell you is that potential growth in South Africa has eroded, and that we are seeing growth being higher than potential, and if this continues, we have seen that the output gap is closing, and uh, once the output gap closes, and we expect that it will actually even turn positive, uh, that would mean that uh, inflation uh, will uh, be rising, and we have got to be acting uh, in accordance with, with that. Um, uh, we can debate because there are lots of things. The other way to make sure that that doesn't close is that we have got to raise potential and then we are back to all those things that South Africans we like talking about but we do not do called structural reforms. And so structural reforms have got to take place so that we increase the potential growth rate of the economy. The worrying thing in with this is that you are actually having the output gap closing at such low levels of growth, and we actually need higher levels of growth to deal with the challenges that we face as the economy. But Chris, you deal with the assumptions, and then I'll ask the other two members if there is anything uh, to add, and central bankers are also very good correcting each other. They normally will say that what the governor actually wanted to say is this, which means that I got something wrong, uh, but... Um, <laughs> I won't go there. Um, so uh, on the electricity price assumption, uh, just to say in the MPC statement for the September meeting, we flagged very directly that we're worried a lot about electricity prices precisely because of ESCOM's uh, submission to NOSA of the 32% or, or so increase. That is not priced into our forecast. We have uh, electricity uh, price inflation for 2023 at 8.9%, which is slightly lower than the 9.2% we had at the time of the last meeting. And the reason why it's come down is just because uh, recent outcomes have actually been a bit below uh, what we expected. 7.7% versus about 8.2% was our expectation. So yes, there's very much uh, upside risk to the forecast coming from electricity prices. Thanks. Uh, Zianda, do you have uh, uh, questions for the rest of the panelists? Not yet, Governor. Thanks. Uh, in the room? Goodness me, that was an easy examination. Uh, <laughs>
One last question. I'm Brian Scallon from the Da Vinci Institute for Technology Management. Other than what it should be, we manage it back there. If it is growing too slow, we try to stimulate it and take it and take it up. What we really say, steer, is inflation. And if you want to know where we are taking it, we are taking it to 4.5. Um, troublemaker. Are you asking me to ask a question? Um, hello, it's Peter Atar Montalta from Intellidex. I wanted to ask maybe about uh, frozen chicken interest on the, on the panel, but uh, to actually ask the question. Um, you talk in the report about uh, these underlying sticky issues from industrial policy enterprises. I was wondering what that actually means for short-term monetary policy, uh, how you have to react to that, uh, and in particular this idea of contagion from non-core into core, which you highlight a lot in the report today, uh, what maybe higher frozen chicken prices means for that issue. Thank you. Who wants to deal with frozen chickens? Uh, <laughs> want to deal, anyone wants to deal with those questions? Rashad, let's start with you. <laughs> well, not, not specifically with pro, uh, frozen chicken. I, I guess I'll take your, your, your overlying, uh, um, overview question. I mean, it is interesting that, that um, inflation in the economy is generally much lower uh, when the economy is more competitive. But you can have inflation even low when the economy is not competitive. So let's say that in the, in the last four years, we had massive increases in tariffs. And we now reach a point where uh, prices uh, have leveled to reach a particular point. But, but the tariff increases subsequently are much lower. So you have an economy where the price level is very high, but the change in prices may not necessarily be that high because all the profit margins are sitting in the, in the economy already. So, so that's the dilemma we face, that uh, it's one thing to say uh, that the economy is uh, competitive because um, there are all sorts of movements, uh, all sorts of kind of relative forces in the economy that keep, keeps prices down. But monetary policy is in a very difficult position. It's most ineffective in trying to deal with those short-term structural constraints where prices are persistent because of structural issues. So, so I, think, you know, I think this is really our dilemma. Our dilemma is we've got to take as our starting point uh, what's going to happen to prices. So electricity is quite interesting because you could say, let's assume that electricity prices move up 30% from this year to next year, and it moves down uh, to 5%. So in our trajectory, we actually, in the transmission mechanism period, we actually don't have to act unless we think there's second round effects from the 30% increase. So it, it is a very tricky relationship. Thanks. Um, thanks, Governor. Uh, very inspired by chickens. I, I think, you know, when one looks at terror setting and what it's meant to do, I, I think that there are some useful lessons for us there. So yes, there can be a tariff that is set on a commodity uh, under the guise of dumping, for example. Uh, but in that application that gets lodged at ITAC, there are some interesting facts that potentially arise about the value chain. Because when you get to a price, a final price, there are intermediate costs in between. So understanding the full value chains uh, is something that's important and useful to do because you need to understand the drivers of the cost structure in the economy. Um, so we don't get into those nitty gritties as a MPC, but there are other agencies in government that are very important. So competition authorities have done very important work in a number of areas, bread, uh, construction, etc. So I think as we talk and highlight the importance of structural reforms, the importance of different agencies, I think that's what we're trying to get to as the MPC. There is underlying work around the cost structure uh, that needs to be done. So, um, so chickens have got some lessons for us as well, Peter, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much for your uh, attendance. Uh, are there any announcements? Thank you very much, Governor. So the Governor has just referred to the Q&A session as an easy examination.
my sense is that um, there are a number of themes that have come out of this session, and I hope that you all take some time to reflect on them as you engage with the Monetary Policy Review publication, uh, and hopefully you read it from cover to cover. As I begin to close the session, uh, please note that your feedback is important to us. Uh, those of you who have joined us in person would have received an evaluation form upon registration, and so we'd really appreciate it if you took the time to complete that and hand it uh, back to the ushers um, uh, uh, within the facility. For those of you online, please note that we will send an email with the evaluation form, so if you could please spare the time to complete it. So to our guests, both online and in person, I'd like to thank you very much for your attendance and participation. And for those of you with us um, in person, I'd like to in invite you to a networking session straight after this event. Uh, it will be held just outside this conference room. Uh, and please be sure to collect a copy of the NPR on your way uh, before you go home. And there's a lot to engage with in that uh, document. Uh, but from my side, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, and we look forward to hosting you for the next NPR in April next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>